Now's the time to open our Bibles together to the book of Galatians and the second chapter. It is on. Don't tell me it's not on this time. <laughs> Yesterday, if you missed the entertainment, I started talking without turning my microphone on. But I see the green light here. Is it not working? Oh, all right. Be still my beating heart. So, for our message from the Word of God this morning, let's return to Galatians chapter 2. Oh, yeah, we do have the handout to hand out. And uh, Pastor Mark is going to give you a list of scriptures that will make it easier for you to follow along with the message uh, this morning. Many years ago, Dr. Ed Bedor of the Berean Bible Institute, uh, I was already teaching at Berean Bible Institute, and one day the director, Dr. Bedore, asked me, can you teach a class on Daniel and Revelation in 16 weeks? And I told him, no, I don't think I can do it do both of those books in a 16-week uh, semester. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought if I write out all the scripture verses that I want to compare while I'm teaching, maybe I could squeeze the highlights in. And uh, then I started thinking, boy, you know, it'd be nice to squeeze more in when I go to these conferences. And so I've been doing it ever since that time. Well, by now you're in Galatians chapter 2. <clears throat> and I'd like to begin with the story of a man who had just graduated business school. And he had just moved into a new office. A little later in the day, when he saw his first customer start to make his way through the door, he decided that he was going to try to look like a big shot in front of his first customer. So he grabbed the phone off his desk and said, you tell those clowns in New York that I'm not going to take anything less than a million dollars for my part in this operation. And he hung up the phone and then looked at the man who had just walked in and said, and what can I do for you? And the man said, I'm from AT&T and I'm here to hook up that phone. <laughs> So, there was a businessman who might have thought of himself as a big shot, but he was a good example of that old saying that says, things aren't always what they seem. And that was true back in the Apostle Paul's day as well, as we'll see in a moment. But first, here in Galatians chapter 2, Paul has been telling us about what happened at the Jerusalem Council where he met with the 12 apostles to decide if his new message of grace was from God. Let's begin in verse 1 to get the context and read the verses we studied yesterday. And we'll pick up our study in verse 6, where we left off. In Galatians 2.1, Paul says, Then, 14 years after I got saved, I went up again to Jerusalem 
with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately, privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seemed to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person, for they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. <clears throat> Now to begin with, that word somewhat there, in this context, means a person of importance. So Paul is talking about some men who seemed to be important, but he's implying that things were not as they seemed. So now we have to figure out who he was talking about. And from the way he talks about them, you would think they were unsaved men. But we know they weren't unsaved because he just finished talking about the false brethren at the Jerusalem Council in the first five verses of the chapter. Then when he starts verse six with a but, that means now he's talking about men who were not false brethren. Men who were legitimately saved brethren who only seemed to be important. And when verse 6 calls them these who seemed to be somewhat, he must be talking about somebody he mentioned earlier in the passage, right? And the only other men he mentioned so far are those false brethren, besides the ones in verse 2 where he says of those who were of reputation. And yesterday we saw the ones who were of reputation were the twelve apostles. They had the biggest reputation in the Jewish kingdom church. So they're the ones Paul's talking about in verse 2 there who seemed to be somewhat well, maybe you're thinking, well, wait a minute, Pastor. The 12 apostles didn't seem to be important. <laughs> the 12 apostles were important, at least to the Jewish kingdom church. So there's no way Paul would disrespect them by saying in verse 6, whatsoever they were, it maketh no difference. To me. And that's true. We know that Paul did respect the twelve apostles because one of the reasons he went to Jerusalem was to get the approval of the twelve apostles on his new message, as we saw yesterday. 
But here's the thing. Paul was not disrespecting them personally, and he wasn't disrespecting the office of the Twelve Apostles. I think he was objecting to an importance that men had given to the Twelve Apostles that went far beyond the importance that the Lord had given the Twelve. I think he was disrespecting a religious tradition that had arisen in those days that made the Twelve Apostles out to be some kind of mystical men. And you're probably thinking, well, why would you think that? And it's because it's a tradition that still exists today in the Roman Catholic Church. Every time Rome paints a picture of the Twelve Apostles, they've always got a halo around their head, don't they? And that shows that Rome is giving the Twelve an importance that was above what God had given them. And the Apostle Paul was having no part of that tradition. Now, if you're not convinced that Rome's tradition of making too much of the Twelve Apostles goes all the way back that far, I think we can prove that Rome's tradition about the Lord's Supper goes back that far. As you may or may not know, I was brought it up in the Catholic faith. Catholicism says that the bread of the Lord's Supper is the actual body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they believe and teach that the cup of the Lord's Supper is the actual blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that is not what the Apostle Paul says about the Lord's Supper in your first reference in 1 Corinthians 10, 16. Paul says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the blood of Christ? Is that what yours says? If it does, it's a misprint. No, Paul says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Paul says that the bread and the cup represent the communion we have around the body and blood of of Christ, the, the fellowship that we have in him, the way we have fellowship with each other around any meal like that. But here's the thing. Paul wouldn't have had to say that unless he was already having to fight that devilish tradition that the communion elements are the actual body and blood of Christ. Do you know what Rome calls the Lord's Supper? They call it the sacrifice of the Mass. Do you know what Paul went on to say when talking about the Lord's Supper in your next reference in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 20? He says, the things that the Gentiles sacrifice they sacrificed unto devils and not to God. And he says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Rome has made a devilish thing out of the Lord's Supper. And of a practical nature, that means that if you're invited to a wedding or a funeral where they have a, a mass service, 
I would encourage you not to partake of the communion elements because Paul says you can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. But to get to the point, if Rome's tradition about the communion goes all the way back to Paul's day, I don't think it's much of a stretch to think that their tradition of venerating the Twelve Apostles too much was already also going on in those days. That's why in verse 6, Paul says that God accepts no man's person either. He's saying that God did not accept the importance that religion was giving to those Twelve Apostles. When it comes to that business of accepting no man's person, look at your next reference in Job 32, 21. He said, let me not accept any man's person, neither let me give flattering titles to anyone. So there in that context, the idea of accepting of persons means to give them flattering titles. And I think that's what accepting persons means here in verse 6 when it says God accepts no man's persons because, well, do you know what Rome calls the Twelve Apostles? I was emailing back and forth with a devout Catholic not long ago, and I learned that Rome calls the Twelve Apostles the Pillars of the Church. How's that for a flattering title? <laughs> so I think what Paul is saying in verse 6 is that God did not accept the flattering title that the religious traditionists of those days gave the twelve apostles. And neither would Paul. And that means, back up in verse 2, when he says, uh, when he talks about them which were of reputation, he's talking about the twelve apostles. And he said in verse 6, in conference, they added nothing to me. Now that means that what most Christians call the Jerusalem Council was actually the Jerusalem Conference. In conference, they added nothing to me. And that's what we're having this weekend, isn't it? A Bible conference. And when it comes to having a Bible conference, with the Twelve Apostles. That's something that Paul refused to do right after he got saved. Look back in chapter 1 and verse 15. When he talks about where he, when he got saved, he said, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, called me by his grace, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but he went into Arabia instead. And at the end of verse 16 there, that word confer, that's the verb form of the noun conference. I think right after Paul got saved, the Lord Jesus Christ told him not to have a Bible conference, not to confer with those flesh and blood 12 apostles, so that nobody could think that he got his message from the Twelve Apostles. But now that he's been preaching his grace message for 17 years, I think here in chapter 2 the Lord told him, okay, 
now it's time to go have that Bible conference with the 12 apostles so that you can communicate your gospel to them. I looked up that word confer there in a old dictionary Pastor Stam gave me that's so good when it comes to Bible words. And it said that the word confer actually means to give. And we use it that way when we say things like, I confer upon you the title of the Duke of Earl. Smile if you remember the song, The Duke of Earl. All right, I see some smiles. <laughs> but if confer means to give, then a Bible conference is a meeting where people get together to give each other their ideas about the Bible, right? But as Paul says in verse 6 there of our text, the conference that he had with the 12 was pretty one-sided because he says that they uh, added, could add nothing to him. They couldn't give him any information of the Bible that he didn't already have. You know, yesterday we saw that the 12 apostles preached the law of Moses that the Lord told them to teach. And hey folks, the Apostle Paul already knew the law of Moses from studying his Bible and from his days in law school. Did you know that Paul went to law school? Look what he says about that in Acts 22 and verse 3. He said, I am a Jew brought up at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers. The Apostle Paul had been taught the law of Moses perfectly in the most prestigious law school in all of Israel. And Paul also knew the kingdom program that the 12 apostles taught. He learned that from Barnabas, the guy we read about in verse 1, the guy who hung around with Paul. And I think that Paul also learned about the kingdom program from a book of the Bible that had already been written, the book of Matthew. It had been written by that time. Add it all up, and it means that the 12 apostles could add nothing to Paul's understanding of the Bible. But he could add plenty to their understanding of the Bible, as it says in the next verse of Galatians 2, in verse 7, where he says, But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Now, do you see that word contrary-wise there? That means something that is opposite, as it does in your next cross-reference in 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9, where Peter said, Be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary-wise, blessing. The opposite of railing on someone is blessing someone. And the opposite of, 12, of the 12 apostles adding nothing to Paul is that he added something to them. He added the grace message that the Lord had sent him to Jerusalem to communicate to the 12 apostles. And in verse 7 he says that that gospel that he preached is called the gospel of the uncircumcision. 
Now, do you remember what that word gospel means, anyone? It means good news. And you know what? Peter's gospel didn't have any good news for uncircumcised men. Nobody did until the Apostle Paul. At least that's what Paul told the Ephesians in your next reference in Ephesians 2, 11 and 12. He told them, remember that ye being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called on circumcision, with a capital U, that at that time ye were without Christ, having no hope. So, when Paul calls his gospel the gospel of the uncircumcision, that is about as radical a dispensational change as you're going to see in the Bible. Finally, there was good news for uncircumcised men. And in case you don't understand what Paul means when he said that these two gospels of circumcision and uncircumcision, were committed to him and to Peter, Paul goes on in Galatians 2 and verse 8 to explain what he means when he says, For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And that word wrought there in the first line, that word is the past tense of the word work. And you see that in your next reference in Nehemiah 6.16 where they perceive that this work was wrought of our God. So what Paul is talking about here in verse 8 Something we read about in your next reference in 1 Corinthians 12, 10, the working of miracles. Paul is saying that God wrought miracles to authenticate Peter's ministry to the circumcision, and he wrought miracles in Paul to authenticate his ministry to the uncircumcision. But the problem with that is lots of believers in those days were able to work miracles. Even the carnal Corinthians, as you see in your next reference in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 11, where Paul talks about the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man gifts of healing to another, prophecy to another, diverse kinds of tongues to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So, Lots of believers worked miracles during that, that time of transition from God's kingdom program to our grace program today. It wasn't just apostles working miracles. But look back at that last reference in the last line. Do you see the word severally there? <clears throat> when it says that the self-same spirit divideth these gifts to every man severally. I looked that word up in the dictionary and it means one apiece. And what he's saying is that each man was only given one miraculous gift. So the man who could speak in tongues couldn't interpret tongues. The man who could prophesy couldn't heal the sick. But apostles had all the gifts. 
You know, the Apostle Paul could speak in tongues, right? He told the Corinthians that. We've all, we also saw in the book of Acts where he healed people. And the Apostle Peter, didn't he speak in tongues at Pentecost? Shake your head up and down, make me feel good. <laughs> and later on, he healed people. People, uh, he healed people and he spoke in tongues. That's how you know a man was an apostle. He had more than one miraculous gift. And that's what Paul means in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, when he says, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you guys in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. But just not, not just one ability to do a miracle. The signs of an apostle were that they could do all the different miraculous gifts. But now here's another thing you have to keep in mind. In those days, there were all kinds of apostles beside Peter and Paul, right? The twelve had, I mean, the, the, the God's kingdom program had twelve apostles. And they all spoke in tongues at Pentecost, didn't they? And they all healed people. And some of the Corinthians that Paul has been writing to there too, some of them had the gift of apostle as well. So there were all kinds of people who had the ability to do more than one kind of miracle. The thing that proved that Paul was the apostle of the uncircumcision, like he said in verse 8 there, is something you read about in Acts 19, 11, and 12. God brought special miracles by Paul so that from his body were brought unto the sick Aprons and the diseases departed from them. Nobody else who had the gift of healing could heal from a distance like that. All the others had to be there and lay their hands on them. All the others except Peter. Look what it says about Peter in your next reference in Acts 5, 15, and 16 brought forth the sick into the streets, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them, and they were healed, every one. And that's how God proved that Peter was the apostle of the circumcision. He wrought special miracles by Peter as well. Verse 8 says that he was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. He did mighty miracles like those special miracles. But now as we read on and get to the last verse of our text in verse 9, we see that Peter wasn't the only circumcision apostle at the Jerusalem council. Look what Paul says in verse 9. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go to the heathen and they would go to the circumcision. Now, you probably know that the Cephas there in the beginning is another name for Peter. He was an apostle of the kingdom program, and so were James and John. And when it says that they seem to be pillars, I think that means it looked for all the world like they were not going to budge and recognized that Paul was the apostle of the uncircumcision. But as it says there, eventually they did. Paul privately and graciously shared things with them and they accepted it. 
But do you remember earlier this morning when I said that religion was probably already calling the twelve pillars, just like Rome calls them the pillars of the church? So I can't help but wonder if maybe Paul was also saying they seemed to be the pillars that religion was making them out to be. I don't know for sure. That's, uh, that's something you could study out for yourself. But here I need to point out about James there in verse 9. James was an apostle of the kingdom program, but he wasn't one of the 12 apostles. He was the Lord's brother. Peter and John there in verse 9, they were part of the 12 apostles, though. And that gave them a quorum of the apostles that they needed to make official decisions like the one they were making here. You say, well, what, what do you mean by a quorum? <laughs> Well, do you remember what we learned in school about the United States Senate? How many senators are there? There's a hundred senators. But they can't make official decisions without a quorum of senators being president, present. And the quorum is 51. If there's not 51 senators present, they can't take a vote and make any official decisions. But a quorum doesn't have to be just over half. A quorum can be any number that you set up it to be. And the Lord told the 12 apostles that all they needed for a quorum was two. Look what he told them in Matthew 18, 18. Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you, don't overlook those words. Those words mean I'm about to tell you the same thing using different words so you know what I mean when I say what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything they shall ask it shall be done for them of my father which is in heaven now I know what most Christians say about those verses they say the Lord was telling us Christians that if two of us get together to ask God for anything in prayer, that God will give it to us. Well, how's that working out for you? Because <laughs> it doesn't work for me. And the reason it doesn't work for me is that's not what the Lord was telling the twelve. He was telling them that it would take two of them to make official decisions in his absence after he died, rose again, and ascended into heaven. And he promised them. He said, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In other words, what they decided on earth, any decision they made on earth, would be a decision that God recognized and accepted in heaven. It would be just as legally binding, Lord bound, in heaven as it is on earth. And to get to the point, verse 9 of our text here says that at the Jerusalem Council, a quorum of Peter and John loosed themselves from something. They loosed themselves from something the Lord told them to do in your next reference in Matthew 28, 19. He told them, Go ye therefore and teach 
all nations. Go teach the Gentiles. All the nations of the Gentiles. James and John at the Jerusalem Council loosed that commission to go to the nations when they perceived that God sent Paul to the nations. Just as Paul said he did in your next reference in Romans 1.5. He said, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among the one nation of Israel. No, that's the way it used to be. Now it's among all nations. When the 12 apostles perceived that God sent Paul to the heathen nations, they loosed their commission to go to the heathen nations and recognized Paul's. And that is the official approval that the Lord had sent Paul to Jerusalem to get from those 12 apostles. Then Peter and John didn't just loose themselves from something that day. They bound themselves, it says in verse 9, to go to the circumcision. Now, I know what Rome says about Peter being the first pope since I grew up in the Catholic Church. But folks, if Peter was the first pope, he was the pope of the Jews, not of the Gentiles, right? Now... We know that the 12 apostles kept their word because after this council, you don't see them going to Gentiles in the Bible. They say, okay, Paul's doing that. God did send Peter to one Gentile back in Acts 10, but that was before he promised not to go any, to any Gentiles in Acts 15. Once the 12 apostles promised they wouldn't go to the nations, they kept their word and never went to another Gentile, as far as we know in the Bible. But you know what? I sometimes get asked at BBS about Paul. Because people wonder if Paul kept his word that he's given here to go not to the Jews. Because look what he says in Acts 17, 1 and 2. It says they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto those Jews. <laughs> Only one year and two chapters later, after the Acts 15 council, Paul went to some Jews. And that verse says it was his manner to go to the Jews. It was his habit to go to, it was his custom to go to the Jews wherever he went. That means that whole year he'd been going to the Jews, right after promising he wouldn't. And in your next reference, we see he never stopped going to the Jews. Eight verses later in Acts 17, 10, it says, The brethren sent Paul unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. And in the parentheses there, I listed three or four or five other places where he kept going to the Jews. So you know, it looks like Paul would have made a good politician. <laughs> he said he'd do one thing and he did another. People were probably making jokes in those days. How can you tell when Paul's lying? His lips are moving like they do with politicians. You've heard that joke. <laughs> but here's the solution to the idea that Paul didn't keep his word. When Paul said in verse 9 that he would go to the heathen, that word used to mean the Gentiles, as you see in your next reference in Malachi 1.11. My name shall be great among the Gentiles, God said, for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord. So the heathen used to be the Gentiles, right? But after the Jews crucified the Lord Jesus 
and stoned his prophet Stephen, Israel lost her, I like to call it her favorite nation status with God. And now today and ever since then, Israel is just another one of the nations, folks. Just another one of the heathen nations. So Paul didn't break his word when he said he'd go to the heathen and then went to the Jews because unsaved Jews were now considered as heathen as the unsaved Gentiles used to be. But back in verse 9, if Paul was now going to unsaved Jews, what does verse 9 mean when it says, James and Peter promised to go to the circumcision. Well, what did Paul say about that word circumcision in Romans 2, 28 and 29? I think I got those verses out of order, but uh, and skip on down to the next one, Romans 2, 28 and 29. He is not a Jew, which is one outward. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he's a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit. That means that the twelve bound themselves to go to save Jews. Jews who were Jews in the heart the Jews who'd gotten saved under their ministry. I like to call what the Jews did after the, Jeru uh, the 12 apostles did after the Jerusalem Council, a kind of a maintenance ministry among the Jews that were already saved under their ministry. They weren't out trying to evangelize like Paul, they were just conducting a maintenance ministry to the saints the Jewish saints who were already saved. They were teaching them in their synagogues and they were writing letters to them so that the Jewish kingdom saints could grow in their understanding of the Jewish kingdom program. And they let Paul go to the unsaved Jews and unsaved Gentiles. That explains what Paul said in that verse we skipped in Romans 11:13, when he says, I am the apostle of the Gentiles. Did you ever tell people that, you know, Paul's our apostle for today and show them that verse to prove it? And then somebody says, well, what, what about the Jews? Don't they have an apostle? Well, the thing about that is even if you're Jewish, Paul is your apostle and not Peter anymore. Because Paul is the apostle of the nations, and Israel's now just another one of the nations. All right, in closing, the reason you should care about all of this, the reason you should care who your apostle is, is because God gave Paul not just a new gospel of salvation without the law, he gave him an entirely new program of how to live in this dispensation of grace. And if you think Peter is your apostle, you're going to be as hopelessly confused about the law and baptism and tongues as most of the rest of the Christian world is. You're going to think that all those things should be part of our program. That's why you as a believer should care about who your apostle is and who he was sent to minister to. But if you're here this morning and you're not saved, you should care about who your apostle is because if you think Peter is your apostle, you're going to think the way to get saved is the way Peter said in 1 Peter 3.21. And what did Peter say in 1 Peter 3.21? Baptism doth also now save us. 
Peter preached the same thing he did at Pentecost. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And if you think Peter is your apostle, and you want to get saved, you think, well, I guess i got to be baptized to be saved. But your apostle Paul, our apostle Paul says that salvation is not by doing works like water baptism. He said in your last reference in Titus 3 and verse 5 that salvation is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us <coughs> by the washing of regeneration and not by the washing of water baptism. Today we're not saved by the washing of water baptism. We're saved by the washing of regeneration, the washing of being regenerated, born again, without water baptism. So if you're watching this video or you're here this morning, you need to know if you want to trust, if you want to be saved, you don't have to do any works because the Lord Jesus Christ did all the work necessary for your salvation on the cross of Calvary. And your apostle Paul says all you need to do to be saved is believe that he did all the work necessary for you on the cross. So if you're not saved this morning, why not believe that right now before it's eternally too late? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray. It is the earnest desire of the heart of every child of God here this morning that if there be one without Christ at this time, that he will understand that Yes, the Bible does give confusing messages about how to say how to be saved. Maybe they've maybe they've even heard some of them and wonder, well, how can anybody be sure of what the Bible says about how to be saved? Now we know. Now you know if you're listening in today. And we pray, Father, to you that you would cause them with before another moment goes by to make that step of putting all of their faith in what Christ did for them. And, and Father, as we close this conference, I pray your blessing on this assembly. I pray your blessing on Pastor Dilly and his ministry to these people. I pray that it might be something that edifies your saints. It's something that at the judgment seat of Christ, each one will be able to stand before your Son and be richly rewarded for all that they have done. I thank you for their steadfast faith that they've had over these many years now. And I pray that it will continue. And I pray it in the Savior's name. Amen.